Thank you, Jessica. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jose Fernandez, and together with my colleague Patricia, we'll be providing Spanish uh, interpretation and English interpretation. Um, in a few moments, the interpretation tool will be turned on, and you'll be able to find uh, a globe icon on the bottom of the screen. Please click on it and select English as your interpretation language. If you are with us via an iPhone or a tablet, you might not be able to find that globe icon, but instead, on the bottom of the screen, you'll see a three-dot menu. Please click on it, select language interpretation and English as your language. I'm going to provide the same instructions in Spanish. Muy buenas tardes a todos. Eh, soy José Luis Fernández y junto con mi compañera Patricia vamos a vamos a ver en el español. En unos momentos voy a iniciar esa función, esa herramienta y Cuando eso, cuando la se inicia esa función, podrán localizar el icono de un globo o de un mundo en la parte inferior de la pantalla. Si están conectados por un iPhone o una tableta, encontrarán un menú de tres puntos. Le dan clic y seleccionan el español como su idioma. Muchas gracias y vamos a comenzar la interpretación. Okay, Eric, we can start the interpretation function, please. Thank you. And Jose, I don't know if it was just me at the end there, you were cutting out a little bit. So just as a reminder, and I see some nodding. So just if there's a way to make sure that you have, um, you know, good connection in case that happens again. Awesome, thank you. It might help with your video off. That's probably what you were doing. Awesome, well, welcome everyone so much. We are just so grateful for all of you to be here. Um, for those that have been a part of the Arvin Lamont Steering Committee and our various subcommittees, this is a busy week. We had a subcommittee yesterday late afternoon for pesticides. We have an agenda setting meeting tomorrow afternoon. So we're just so grateful that you're able to share some extra time with us today for this really important topic. I'm going to briefly share my screen um, to get us started and just sort of remind us why we're here and how we ended up. Um, with today's meeting. So what I'm sharing, I'm also going to have um, my colleague Eric drop in the chat the link to the agenda. We added some details to it. So if you read our agenda that we posted last week, we wanted to add a few more details based on community feedback to what today's meeting is all about. Um, but in short, in the Community Emissions Reduction Program as a part of AB 617 for Arvin Lamont, there was a measure to address impacts from oil wells in the community. And you can see here, we actually named the measure. It's SERP Measure 5D. It's one of 31 measures in the Community Emissions Reduction Program to reduce emissions or reduce exposure to emissions in this community. And so um, the main commitment from that comes from the California Geologic Energy Management Division, or CalGEM, um, who is one of the state agency partners who you'll hear a lot from today. If you were at our April 26th meeting, most of that meet, pretty much all of that meeting, I should say, um, was about this measure. And one of the commitments coming out of that meeting was to have a follow-up um, series of meetings with you all in a smaller subcommittee where we get to dive deeper into some of the concerns you all had. So um, I just, knowing that we have a lot to get through, I, as those um, topics come up, I'll have the agencies and whoever's presenting introduce themselves and introduce their team. So I will just acknowledge that the Valley Air District is here with a variety of folks that support either our enforcement team or our outreach team or our community strategies team. We have CalGEM here, who you will be hearing from here shortly. And we also have the California Air Resources Board, among other agencies I see on the call here to just support. And all three of these agencies work together on a variety of the things that you'll hear about today. So I just want to thank everyone. Um, like a lot of our measures, this is certainly interagency but it's also um, just intercommunity. And the reason we're able to present to you today is because of all of the great interaction and feedback we've heard from all of you. Um, so I just wanna thank you all for being here and especially thank CalGEM who was super responsive from our last meeting. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and um, actually pass it to Courtney Smith who is with CalGEM. Great, thanks so much, Jessica. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, 
First, I just want to say that uh, we are so glad that so many members of the steering committee um, were interested in forming this subcommittee, really specifically focused on addressing concerns with oil and gas wells. Um, as Jessica alluded to, when we met um, with many of you in uh, the last week of April, um, you know, we, we provided a broad overview of several of the activities we had um, underway that um, begin to address uh, concerns with oil and gas wells. Um, but we also made several commitments, um, and a lot of progress has been made since the end of April on, on those commitments. So for today, we wanted to follow up with you all on three commitments in particular that we made. Um, first, um, for those of you that were there, um, we did hear and got a request from the community um, for a training. Um, in order to provide folks with uh, situational awareness on, um, you know, knowing what to look for, for in, in terms of like oil and gas operations that might serve as potential hazards. So that way, you know, you guys are aware of if, if something might be significant enough that warrants call in first responders or perhaps the air district or CalGEM. So first we wanted to um, have a brief discuss, a, pre a brief planning discussion with you all so we can make progress on that. Um, the second thing um, that we wanted to cover with you all is, um, as we shared uh, in last uh, the last week in April, um, we uh, basically presented to you all and, and made a commitment to carry out a joint inspection effort within and around the Arlington Lamont community area. Um, this is a was a joint inspection effort with CalGEM. Um, but also with our colleagues at the California Air Resources Board and the Air District as well. Um, we worked together um, as part of a methane task force that we've developed with several agencies. Um, just as a reminder, I know we covered this at the end of April, but as a reminder, this joint inspection effort, which we presented to you in April, and um, we're here today to, to tell you how it went. Um, this is really in addition, it's an above and beyond the inspection work that each of the agencies undertakes, um, including the one that my colleague Rohit had presented to you all the last time we met. Um, but importantly, when we did, we committed to you that once we completed the joint inspection, we would be back to be able to share with you what the results are of that inspection and also the actions that um, we plan to take. Um, that inspection was conducted last week it just finished on Thursday. And so we wanted to, um, and I expect to take a, a good chunk of time today to share with you what we found um, and also what we're doing in response to those find, findings. And importantly, to discuss with you any questions or concerns you may have. And then lastly, the third thing that we were hoping to cover today, if we have time, is uh, you all asked us to provide a demonstration of a mapping tool that um, we had mentioned that's available on our public website that maps wells we think are very likely orphan wells in the state, meaning there's no operator around who's viable and responsible to be able to manage it. So we, um, we have a CalGen staff person who's joined us today to demonstrate and show folks how to use it as, as y'all requested. So, um, before, before we jump in, um, I don't know if we could just pause if there's any questions on the agenda um, from subcommittee members before we hop in. No? Okay. Well, with that, um, I'm going to um, invite my colleague, Rohi. Oh, hi. Did someone have a question or comment? It might have been an, an unmute situation, so I think okay. we're good. All right, very good. Um, well, with that, um, I want to um, invite my colleague Rohit um, to talk with you all and get some feedback on um, on holding a, a training um, as you guys requested. Rohit? Thank you, Courtney. Uh, as I said, my name is uh, Rohit Sharma, and I'm uh, acting chief deputy uh, of operations with CalGEM. And, um, uh, you know, as Courtney uh, mentioned that uh, in our previous meeting, uh, community members expressed their uh, uh, interest in receiving some training 
and information on reporting any concerns they uh, they found uh, related to oil and gas uh, operations um, like if they see something or if uh, if they hear something or smell something how do they they uh, you know report to the to us so uh, i would like to ask community members uh, and get your feedback uh, about your preference or uh, virtual or in-person training, uh, what do you uh, uh, prefer? We are open for both. Um, you know, we can do a virtual as well as a, you know, uh, be there on the on the facility and give you some uh, some uh, you know tips how to um, you know look for or see something uh, how to report it to to us uh, Calgem, um, and 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 also we would like to get your feedback on the. Uh, timing for those uh, training when uh, so that we can start coordinating those those meetings uh, or trainings so um, uh, uh, we will uh, welcome any feedback from the community members when uh, uh, if, if uh, they, they would like to have us to be there at the site uh, and, and uh, meet with you I see some hands up Diana Sí, buenas tardes. Disculpen, no me miro muy bien. Uh, yo como residente de la comunidad, sí me gustaría, bueno, dependiendo el horario, uh, si fueran en persona, ¿verdad? Dependiendo el horario, pero si fuera como a este horario más o menos o más temprano, sí preferiría en Zoom porque yo este, tengo mi trabajo que es cuidar a mis nietos o yo soy la babysitter de mis nietos. So, o podría también ser como le llaman ahora hybrid, que es en persona y en Zoom al mismo tiempo. So, pienso que trabajaría para las personas que no pudiéramos ir en persona. Pero esa es mi, mi, mi opinión en, en, en mi situación, ¿verdad? Como residente. seems fairly reasonable, Rohit. It sounds like hybrid might be um, really helpful. Um, and also it sounds like from a timing perspective, maybe later in the day, since folks have commitments during, during the day. That sounds good. Are there others who want to share? Uh, yeah, I definitely agree with the with the hybrid idea, um, and I think uh, you know, I, for me, I'm, a, I'm you know like a visual learner, so I would definitely love to see like a, as part of the training some examples of what um, you know what what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, um, you know, um, and you know if it's a hybrid and there's an in-person opportunity to go check out you know, certain areas and point out what one would be looking for. Uh, I know some of our community members work out in the fields, which happen to be where some of the pump jacks are and 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 they don't know what, you know, what they should be concerned about. Um, you know, if it's spewing something or if it's smelling a certain way, is that something for them to be concerned about or is that a, a, a smell to be expected? Um, so it'd be good to be able to explain or share that information uh, or, or maybe in like a checklist of what to look out for. Thank you. So far. Yeah, I think um, I also like to echo, I like the, the hybrid idea and um, I really appreciate the focus of this meeting being uh, you know, about the leaks and the map and what was found to share that out. Um, and I would like to offer um, anyone else that would like to maybe talk a little bit more in the weeds to not take up, you know, time for the CSE to the Ivan meeting, the Ivan task force meeting. It's going to be next uh, Tuesday from 1 to 1.30 to 2.30. So I can drop the link there for um, anyone that would like to, to follow up and uh, would like to invite anyone on the methane task force to, to join as well so we can have a conversation there. That sounds great. Cesar, I'll just confirm that we absolutely plan to be there and um, use that venue as well, which we'll, we'll talk about to um, 
to share um, the results from, from the joint inspection that we just conducted. Okay. So, I think looks like um, uh, we'll have a virtual and in-person uh, training and uh, we'll coordinate and we'll get back to you with the timing and the dates of those training. And maybe what we can do too, just recognizing that folks have busy lives and lots of commitments is um, we can maybe um, generate a couple of options for a hybrid meeting, a couple of different dates, and maybe send that through you, Jessica, to um, get feedback from committee members on um, what might, might you know, maximize attendance. We wanna make sure we get as many folks there as possible. And, and of course, if there's, um, you know, for some reason folks aren't able to make it, um, uh, you know, we're, we are able and willing to either record it to make it accessible for, for folks um, or, um, you know, do a follow on um, so we can see how that goes from a timing perspective. Great. Okay. Well, it sounds like we're ready to head to our second item, um, which um, I'm, I'm really excited to kick off for us. Um, so, uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, we, the last time uh, we got to, to meet with you all, end of April, we laid out um, a uh, plan that we had and got your feedback on um, to conduct a joint inspection and enforcement effort across um, many different agencies. And so for this item, we actually do have folks from many agencies here to help present and, and have a discussion with you all. Uh, as Jessica said, this um, inspection effort included um, folks from the Air District. It had folks from CalGEM, um, folks from our, our colleagues at the Air Resources Board, um, and also Cal EPA. And we have representatives from each of those agencies here today to talk about this effort. Uh, before I go deeper, it looks like Diana, you have your hand up. Uh, sí, disculpen. Es nada más sobre la interpretación. No sé si nada más yo estoy escuchando la interpretación, pero se está cortando mucho y se oye a veces muy bajito y es muy, se está cortando demasiado y no podemos entender muy bien. Gracias, Diana. Sí, yeah. iba a mencionar esto a José Luis. Oh, José Luis, we can't hear you. Se está cortando mucho. Thanks for flagging that, Diana. Perfecto. Okay, um, so to start this item where we're presenting on our joint inspection effort, um, I first just wanted to acknowledge for everyone that all of the agencies that I've mentioned that's worked together to carry this work out is here today because we, we, we are working to address community <laughs> in your community. You know, we completely recognize that, you know, folks who live or spend their days near oil and gas production facilities you know, have expressed concerns about the health impacts from exposure to leaks and safety concerns regarding potential explosion risks. Um, so we, we understand these concerns, we share these concerns, and they're part of the reason why we're focusing this um, somewhat new joint inspection and enforcement initiative on wells that are near communities. Um, and so, as I mentioned before, we committed um, when we met with you all and presented our plan that we would come back um, and that we would provide you all with the initial results from our inspections. They were conducted just last week and then also have a conversation with you around what we're doing to address those findings. Um, so we have a couple of folks who are gonna join in, in laying this out. Um, before we actually jump into what the inspection entailed, what we found, we thought that it would be really helpful to break down for everyone a bit um, the health and safety risks that are associated with methane leaks. So that way folks have a bit of context for the results that we're gonna share. So with that, I would love to invite and pass it on to my colleague, Heather um, from the Air Resources Board to, to share that with you all. Hi, thank you, Courtney. Uh, my name is Heather Kiros. I'm the Acting Division Chief for CARBS Enforcement Division. Um, and as Courtney mentioned, I'm going to give an overview of the risks associated with methane leaks. Um, there are two um, that I will talk about. Um, one is the health or exposure risk, um, and the other is, are the safety risks. Um, so with regard to exposure to methane itself, 
um, that is not considered a direct health risk, um, except for at very high levels. Um, however, methane leaks from oil and gas production facilities can be associated with leaks of other toxic compounds. Um, exposure to toxic compounds potentially associated with methane is influenced by several factors. Um, and those factors include how far you are from the leak. Um, and that's because pollutants tend to disperse relatively quickly, um, thereby minimizing exposure the farther away you are from the leak source. Um, another factor is what the components of the gas are. So underground storage facilities and natural gas pipelines contain nearly all methane while production facilities and associated tanks have the potential to emit methane along with other toxics. Um, something else to consider is wind direction and whether sensitive receptors are downwind of a leak and also the level of sensitivity of a receptor has an effect. So exposure could impact some folks more than others. Um, finally, the time of day can impact exposure because certain meteorologic conditions can concentrate pollutants during evening and overnight, um, thereby increasing exposure during those times. Um, additional thing to consider with regard to exposure is that there are other emission sources that may impact public exposure as well. For example, mobile sources, agriculture, other industrial sources, things like that. Um, and exposure to any level of carcinogen is associated with cancer risk. And there are known carcinogens like diesel particulate matter that may drive most of a person's risk. Um, so that's a little bit of an overview of um, exposure uh, related to, the, to, to methane leaks. And then with regard to uh, safety risk, um, methane can present an explosion hazard at very high concentrations or in enclosed areas and when an, an ignition source is present. The lower explosive limit for methane is generally considered to be 5% by volume or 50,000 ppm. And this means that that's the concentration at which the methane could ignite if it had an ignition source. The flammability or explosive properties of methane are significantly minimized as methane dissipates and methane will dissipate quickly from most leaks generally found um, in the components at oil and gas facilities, including wells. Um, and then one additional thing to note with regard to safety risk is that leaking industrial or residential natural gas pipelines typically pose a larger safety concern. Um, so with that general overview, um, I will pause. I can take any questions. We can also hand it over to um, Terry Allen, who will, um, who can provide some more specific results um, on the inspections. Yes, thank you. Okay, um, so I think with that, oh, Emma? Yes, thank you, I'm sorry. I wanted to request a written document, some type of document that outlines everything that you just shared, if you don't mind, please. Um, and I also, um, yeah. I, if, sorry, the, the methane leak, the health impacts of the methane leaks um, I think was the most interesting to me right now. And I was trying to capture everything that you were saying in my notes, but um, you mentioned something about the components of the facilities that whether it, if it's like a storage or yeah, I can't really, can't really remember. Do you mind kind of repeating that section? Sure. Again, please? Thank you. Yeah, so there are certain, there are certain um, parts of an oil and gas facility like underground storage facilities or natural gas pipelines that are that contain nearly all methane so that are purely almost purely methane. Um, there are other um, components, though, like production facilities associated tanks, those are the are the components that have the potential to emit methane along with other toxics. So it, am I um, correct in understanding that the production facilities have a higher risk of methane leaks than the underground storage? 
Um, not sure about the higher risk of methane leaks. I think it's more a higher risk of um, having other toxics along. I understand. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, but they both can pose a, a, a risk of leaks. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Yep. Uh -huh. Can I just real quick address the other point Emma made? I, Emma requested a written documentation and um, yeah, you beat us to it, Emma. Um, Matt will talk, I, I think Matt will talk a little bit about this, but um, since you raised it, just wanted to let folks know that, you know, we just finished inspections on Thursday. Um, we absolutely wanted to share the results verbally with you as soon as we could today. And we totally recognize this is gonna be a lot of information. So we're planning to um, document this all. And I think when we met end of April, we asked you, what are the best ways we can get this information to you? Um, and so we would like to follow the, those recommendations, which include um, you know, sending an email out that that goes through all of this. Um, uh, we, I think we're planning to do that Monday um, and uh, Jessica is gonna help us distribute it. So you can expect Monday to get the, the written email of what we're about to cover. Um, and then in addition to that, I know um, Cesar had flagged using the, the Ivan um, uh, uh, venue to also share, which we're planning to do. So just wanted to flag that since you raised it, Emma. Hi, yeah, I had two questions. Uh, the first question is, uh, you mentioned that there was uh, the methane can explode at a volume of 50,000 uh, parts per million. Um, what radius uh, would be, I guess, in danger or, you know, how close would someone have to be um, yeah, to be in danger? That's a really good question. Um, and what I'll first say is that we are pulling together um, several different agencies to sort of work through some more of these details to make sure that we understand impacts like that. Um, at this point, uh, my understanding is that as soon as the methane starts to dissipate, then once it goes below that concentration, that it's no longer um, an explosive risk. Um, but your question is definitely noted about if there was to be some type of explosion, what is that impact radius? And that is something that we are working to um, with many different folks to try to nail down um, what that would look like. Okay. It, it, okay. And would that be out with the report on Monday or? It's probably not going to be Monday, um, but we are committing to work through that as soon as we possibly can. Um, in the report on Monday, we will share as much as we know right now, um, understanding that there are additional um, facts and things that, that we need to try to nail down with other folks like the fire department and things like that to make sure that we all have a common understanding of what the impacts are. Yeah, because, you know, like in, in Hilltop, it's right up against some houses. Um, yet Arvin High is right across uh, a field, uh, so you know to understand who's in danger in those situations. Mm -hmm. it's, Absolutely, it's extremely valuable. Mm -hmm. um, the my other question was, um, you mentioned that uh, house leaks uh, have a larger safety concern. Uh, how how is that determined? Is that just because it's proximity to people, or is there other factors in that? It, it, it's proximity. So again, this is also something we're working to nail down, but yeah, I think it's proximity to people, but also pressure. Um, so the amount of pressure um, associated with the leak can also have an impact on whether it explodes or if there's an ignition source, whether it's more like a, like a burn um, akin to like a fire on the stove. So pressure can have an effect, which is why the, the, the natural gas lines and things in houses can potentially be more of a risk if it's leaking. Emma? Thank you. Um, do, currently do, um, Permitted wills have to like explain or give information regarding the, I guess, explosion impact upon like a request for a permit. Is that information not provided already from the beginning?
So I might invite uh, maybe Courtney or someone from CalGEM could respond to that. Yeah, so when someone submits to us a request for a permit, um, they don't include that information. Our expectation is that um, all facilities are kept and maintained in a leak-free environment. Um, and so from our perspective, there shouldn't be any, um, any explosion risk. Um, and so that's why having this arm of our inspection and enforcement program is so important to go out and make sure that um, these facilities are kept and maintained in accordance with our requirements. Um, so I hope that helps explain uh, or answer your question, Emma. It did, yeah, thank you, Courtney. And I wonder if, um, if not discussed today, if maybe with the findings that you're gonna share, that if these findings will lead to a, a new criteria to be included as part of the permit request. I mean, I think it's, to me, it kind of seems like information that should should be already included, you know, because there's a huge risk, like Jesus was saying. Um, so I would love to hear more about how, about what the changes to policy will be with these findings. Thank you. I think too, Emma, you'll find um, once we go through some of the inspection results and some of the actions that we're gonna take, I think that will help maybe maybe we can transition to that because I think that will help um you know it, it's hard sometimes when we talk in generality but when we actually see what we find I think it'll be helpful to um to better understand the situation um but like I mentioned you know our expectation from from CalGEM is from the get-go that these operations and facilities are kept in a leak-free environment so that's that's the expectation and we go out to inspect to see if folks are meeting that expectation, are in compliance with that. Um, that's, that's a big part of our inspection program um, to make sure that they're kept in a leak-free environment. But then we have a lot of other requirements that are focused on health and safety we also look at. If they are not, um, then we work with the operator to get them in compliance. And sometimes, as we'll talk about, that also includes taking stronger enforcement action, um, which we'll get into here shortly. Uh, yeah, I get, just second what Emma said. Uh, and is there any notification for, for homeowners that would be within the, this radius of concern um, that, you know, a well has been permitted uh, and that they are now in, in this area of worst case scenario, best case scenario kind of thing of, you know, whether or not it's well maintained or not. Um, yeah, so I think what you'll find, and maybe we can go through some of the inspection results, is instances in which we found that the well was leaking above the lower limit of explosivity. Um, it was very important for us for this very reason to not just inspect the leak itself, but also to um, measure methane um, emissions as you uh, move away from the leak, because that helps us understand if it's dissipating. Um, and and what, what we'll get to here in a minute is that um, these leaks all dissipated in a really small radius, um, which tells us that the, the, the safety risk of explosion um, is, is, is uh, you know, very geographically minimized. And there really isn't, an ex with the leaks that we found, which we should just present the results at this point, um, that, that many of them dissipated to background within feet. Um, so I, I think we should probably go into the results because I think that'll help explain a little bit better what we found. Terry, you want to take it away? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my name is Terry. I work with the California Air Resources Board, manage the Petroleum Oversight and Enforcement section. Um, first, just want to thank you all for uh, having me here tonight, opening this space up. Um, look forward to sharing these results with you and, and also getting your feedback. Um, um, that's definitely something that's very important to us. So uh, again, thank you for this time. Uh, so the original plan that we had was to inspect a total of 67 wells that were within 3,200 feet uh, of the boundaries of Arvin and Lamont. Um, so uh, starting with that as the base of the plan, uh, we had inspectors from each agency. Uh, I'm sorry, let me talk a little slower for the translators. Uh, we had inspectors from each agency um, on site to do the inspections. Uh, the inspections occurred over three days um, last week, uh, May 23rd, 24th, and 25th. Um, and for most of those inspections, the operators were on site. Um, 
And when we were out there, we used a variety of different uh, tools to be able to screen for these leaks. Um, an example of some of the tools that we used are the uh, FLIR camera, um, which stands for uh, forward looking infrared camera. Uh, and that's really just used as a screening tool uh, to detect escaping gases. Uh, and then we also uh, used a few other tools as well. Um, one of them is called the TVA, uh, which is toxic vapor analyzer. Uh, and then another tool um, we actually used out there uh, is a DPIR, which stands for detectopack infrared. Uh, and some of those tools are used um, because they're, uh, they comply with uh, certain standards um, that we have set forth in order to um, substantiate violations. Um, that standard is, is called Method 21. It's a United States EPA standard. Um, so um, with that said, altogether, we inspected a total of 68 wells. Uh, one of those was plugged and abandoned. Um, and then we identified uh, another well uh, nearby that, that staff inspected. Um, out of that uh, 68 wells, 27 were found to be leaking. Uh, four of those were actually repaired on site. Uh, while we were conducting the inspection. Um, of, that, of the 27 leaking wells, 15 of them uh, had leaks that exceeded 50,000 parts per million, um, which is the lower uh, explosive limit um, for methane uh, if there is an ignition source. Uh, all of these dissipated to background within a few feet. Uh, there was one well that dissipated to background uh, in about 15 feet. Um, but it wasn't uh, within a thousand feet of uh, occupied residence or, or a school. Um, and none of these leaks occurred under high pressure uh, or in an enclosed space either. Uh, so if you want to kind of think about it, uh, it, there was an ignition, it would be more of a, a slow burn, similar to what uh, you see on a, a gas stove. Uh, even though there was dissipation to background, um, uh, on all the wells within a few feet. Uh, just out of an abundance of caution, um, the Air District did contact uh, Cal OES, uh, California's Office of Emergency Service. Uh, since uh, three of these wells were, were within a thousand feet of a school and had concentrations that exceeded 50,000 uh, parts per million. Um, as far as uh, the repairs, um, because most operators were on site, they were aware of the repairs that needed to occur. Uh, I do know that the Air District, uh, I believe, was out earlier today with CalGEM staff um, conducting follow-up inspections uh, to make sure those uh, repairs uh, have occurred. Um, but uh, I do want to highlight uh, 11 of the leaking wells um, have not been repaired. Uh, the, uh, there's been an order by CalGEM to plug and abandon those wells, um, and the operators of those wells uh, haven't complied with the order. Um, because of that, uh, of course, the leaks have not been repaired. Um, so CalGEM is actually preparing an emergency contract uh, to have these leaks repaired. Uh, and the contractor should be out um, Friday or Saturday uh, to do a cost time estimate. Um, and, you know, just to soothe any concerns that uh, this may be coming, this is coming, the funding for this is coming from the uh, oil and gas industry's idle well fees. So uh, the taxpayers, you know, you're not using your tax money to fund this. Um, the oil and gas industry is funding this through fees that they pay. Uh, that's the inspection summary. Is there any questions that anybody has? I actually just thought, um, I think we have actually, we were able to get our contractor out sooner than expected. Roki, do you mind sharing an update on, again, these are the 11 walls Terry mentioned were the, the operator has deserted the wells. Um, and so they're, they are unable to, they are not repairing them. Um, so we're gonna bring our contractor out to do that work. Rohit, do you have an update, a real-time update? Yes, so the update is uh, uh, contractor Diltech was uh, on site yesterday and met with our uh, CalGEM staff there and they inspected all the 11 wells and they're evaluating those wells and let us know the cost of the, those repairs and the timeline. Uh, they do not think that these leaks are significant leaks. So uh, they will be able to uh, fix the, all those leaks in a few days, uh, two to three days, I would say. And if we get additional information in terms of timing 
from the contract. They're working right now to figure out with their schedule how they can fit this in. As soon as we get insight into when they can be out to fix them, we will reflect that in the email that we plan to send out on Monday. So that way, if we learn something, you will learn it as well. So far? Yeah, um, I have a few questions, but I think the first one was, uh, what are the three locations of the wells that were within a, a thousand feet of a school? Yeah, I don't have the specific GPS coordinates uh, on hand, but I can I can get those to you. Uh, do you know what schools were the schools that were um, near the leaks that were above fifty thousand parts per million? I believe it was the high school, Ar Arvin. Arvin High School. Near the football field, I think. Okay. And um, what is done when a leak is found below the threshold? Um, there is still a leak and sometimes pressure ebbs and flows. So just because um, it wasn't, you know, above the threshold when the inspector got there doesn't mean that it couldn't be the, you know, be there at some point um, when the pressure does ebb. Uh, so I think if it, is it like a repair if there is any leak found or um, I know in the past there have been no actions taken uh, when just one regulatory body goes out and inspects it because it, exemptions that they're under. Um, so is, is, information shared in a better way between the methane task force to be able to repair leaks even if they're found below the threshold yeah absolutely um you know i'm sorry i'm gonna interrupt for just a brief moment sorry um jose luis we can't hear you it's very low and so our spanish speakers are not able to hear what is being said no, can you raise it up? Maybe the mic needs to be closer to your mouth. I don't know about others, but I you, you can barely hear what you're saying. Otros en el canal de español pueden escuchar a José Luis o está muy bajo? Está muy bajo, no se oye. Probando, probando. Okay. Muy bajo, se corta. Okay, thank you, Patricia. Are we good? Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so, sí, so that's... Sí, se oye muy oh. bien. Gracias. So, yeah, the purpose of, of having staff from the three agencies out there uh, was so that information sharing could occur uh, real time. Um, so uh, each agency uh, is aware of the violations that occurred, and uh, I'll invite the Air District and, and CalGEM to sort of speak, you know, about their enforcement process. Um, the way that, that leaks are treated uh, does depend, of course, on the concentration, um, and um, the way that at least CARB's rule is written is that that could be dependent on, you know, how many leaks are uh, occurring. Um, for that particular well uh, based on the number of components, right? Um, so there's uh, different ways that the leaks are addressed, uh, at least from CARB standpoint. Um, I'll open it up to the Air District and, and to CalGEM to sort of speak about how they approach it. I think I'll take a shot at the first, uh, just to introduce myself. I'm Matthew Bufflebin. I'm the Enforcement Chief at CalGEM. And so from our viewpoint, our agency approaches leaks uh, pretty straightforwardly. We consider every leak to uh, and require every leak to be repaired. And we work with the operator and to notify them of the leak. And fortunately, like in this case, when the operators, most of them were on site and were able to respond pretty quickly. So every uh, leak is a violation um, the way our red regulations are. And so we make sure all the leaks are repaired and followed up upon. I can add to that. My name is Jennifer Lettergerber. I'm a compliance manager with the Air District. 
And um, these wells that were inspected were either subject to district rule or state regulation. And even those leaks that were below the 50,000 ppm limit have requirements for repair. And so those um, repairs are ongoing with the operators and we're currently conducting the re-inspections to ensure that those repairs were made and those leaks are no longer leaking. I think Francisco had his hand up and then we have a question in the chat. Francisco? Sí, mire, ¿Cuánto es, tiempo se... Ese pozo que está ahí para la high school, ese pozo siempre lo, han, lo hemos allá con violaciones. Gustavo lo halló con bolia, bola, yeah. violaciones y luego César y yo fuimos y otra vez lo mismo. Es una fuga que nomás no la han arreglado por años, ya está esas fugas ahí y nunca arreglan ese problema. Ya tenemos años peleándoles con eso y siempre los hayan en violación. Cada vez que hay una, un chequeo, siempre están en violación. Nunca tienen eso arreglado ahí. No sé qué es lo que está pasando con esa compañía. I'll respond to that. Um, I I believe that the wells that are that you're referring to um, are associated with an operator called Sunray Blackstone. Oh, no, but uh, okay, so sun uh, and and okay. testing. Okay, there we go. Um, and Sunray Blackstone is an operator that CalGEM, because as you noted, um, had uh, lots of compliance issues. We had um, identified that there was evidence that they likely deserted their well. Um, so we actually ordered them to be plugged and abandoned. Um, they have not complied with that uh, plug and abandonment. Um, and so CalGEM has determined them to be deserted. Um, and it is why, because there isn't an operator that is repairing the leaks, that's why we're stepping in, doing the emergency contract that we referred to, to have those leaks repaired. Jesus? Hi, yes, I, I wanted to know, uh, well, the question I had asked in the chat, you know, how much time do, uh, do they have to repair? But I also wanted to, I guess, have this understanding. So then, because um, near the foot by field, you said that uh, leak was discovered over 50,000 parts per million. Um, and then the, the, my question was similar to, to Cesar's is, uh, how did notification go out to the um, to the school, to the families, uh, you know, the Lamont and Arvin Wee Patch families go to that football field to watch the football game. Um, this this last week, you guys probably saw a bunch of people graduating um, from that football field. Uh, were they were they also notified? Was there given any any warning about what they were being exposed to? So I'll hop in here and, and say that because these leaks dissipated so quickly, um, and as Terry mentioned, that if, if, there was an if there was an ignition source, that it would be akin to, you know, your, your stove being um, burning, we did not, um, like, it did not present an immediate safety or explosion concern. Um, so we really, in, a, in an abundance of caution for those wells, notified Cal OES, and of course we're here today to let you all know um, about, about the leaking wells and what we're doing to address them. Okay. I, I, I guess I just, I don't know. I, I, 
and maybe it's just my my inability to understand, but I don't understand how uh, a leak at, at my house is more dangerous than than a leak from you know right up against the school. Um, yeah, I, I, if there could be some clarification on that. I know you did. Uh, do you want to take a, a stab at, at clarifying? I know you, you've provided some explanation, but it looks like it might be helpful to explain again um, some of the explosion limit um, and explosion risk. Right, and I think the I think the difference is in terms of the location of the leak and its proximity. To where people are and so the leak and and also whether the leak is happening in an enclosed space and so if you're talking about a leak in your house you're talking about um, potentially leaks from a high pressure line which can increase explosion risk um, you're talking about um, gas potentially collecting within an enclosed space that can contribute to explosion um, with regard to these wells um, the wells are located um, you know, several hundred feet away. Um, their leaks are not happening in an enclosed space. And um, we tried to make sure to measure the concentration of the methane um, to, to figure out at what point the, um, the concentration dissipated to a level that was below an explosion risk. Um, and so, and that dissipation distance was pretty close to the well. So they, the concentrations dropped very quickly um, within a few feet of the well, um, which is why in, in that particular case, um, the determination was made that there was no immediate um, risk to anything, um, you know, to any of the schools or residents or folks that are around those wells. D does that help clarify? It, 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 does, it, it does a bit. Um, it's, it's just an uncertainty, I feel, or uh, an uneasy, e I feel uneasy with how, just the, the, I feel uneasy with the comparison um, and, you know, the, just the, the exposure, because, uh, well, you know, my, my son's little, but in, in a couple of years, he's going to, he's going to be going to that high school and, and understanding that he's right next to uh, that is, is very concerning. Heather and Courtney, can I ask a question as someone who who has helped, has jumped in these meetings because of 617, but is obviously not on the inspection or enforcement side. When you say dissipate, you're meaning like a few feet away, you can't detect any methane. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. So even so, by the time we're hundreds of feet away, there's no chance that any of that methane that you couldn't even detect a few feet away would be reaching say the school a hundred feet away. That's right, yep. Yeah, I can like just to add to that and, and you know, trying to build pictures, I'm definitely a visual person. So, um, you know, I don't know if others learn that it's, that similarly, um, you know, when we're looking at these leaks, you know, these are often like pinhole size leaks. Um, you may have seen imagery from like Aliso Canyon where you had, you know, gas leaks and uh, you know, massive plumes. And, you know, I think that uh, goes into it as well. So like the reading that we're talking about 50,000, that's a, that's a concentration. Um, it doesn't speak to the volume of gas that's coming out of something. Um, and so you know, if it's a really tiny leak, it could have a high concentration, but at the same time be a small amount of gas that's actually coming out of there and still have a high concentration. Um, and so I, I think, you know, when, when it dissipates very quickly like that, that's usually indicative of, uh, it, you know, that it, it's, it's a small volume of gas that's actually coming out of the leak. It's a high concentration at that point, but it's a small volume coming out of that. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm sorry to have to interrupt again, Jose Luis. I think we're just going to have to have Patricia. I, I apologize, but we really can't hear um, what you're saying. Thank you. And if we can, sorry, before we proceed, can we, Jose Luis, can you be in uh, in charge of doing the translation of the chat, and then we'll have Patricia in charge of the interpretation, please. Thank you.
Marisela, are we good to proceed? Yes, okay. Looks like Cesar has his hand up. Yes, um, I understand that we're talking about the dissipation of methane, uh, but along with methane, other volatile organic compounds and other you know, carcinogens can come up. So I would like to know the results of the samples that were taken uh, at these sites. Hopefully samples were taken at each of these leaking sites uh, to find out what was coming up along with the methane, um, because those are you know, more uh, problematic to health. Uh, and um, I would also like to note that the last time these inspections were done, uh, the tool limited at 50,000 parts per million. So there's really no way of knowing how high the levels could have been at that source, because if we don't know uh, if 50,000 is the limit, then it could have been 100,000, it could have been 200,000, and we just wouldn't know um, because of the limits of the uh, instrumentation. So I would like to know if that is the case again in, in, in this case, um, uh, because in uh, last year, there was a leak in a neighborhood called Morningstar, and the uh, agencies went knocking door to door, talking with residents. Uh, they took uh, gas, uh, they took the TVA device and other method 21 methane reading devices to do sweeps around the front yards and the backyards for certain people that are loudest to. Because uh, this, the neighborhood next to the well that we're talking about here in Arvin has been evacuated due to legacy uh, infrastructure that is connected to that pump. And I have received complaints recently from people that are in this neighborhood that they smell strong gases. So I think um, there should be community outreach. You should go door to door knocking. You should ask questions about health effects so that we can collect that information um, because it seems like um, little is being done to collect and understand the effect of community. And I think that that would be a good first step. Really appreciate all of that, Cesar. Um, maybe I could invite um, our inspector, uh, my inspector colleagues to maybe talk a little bit about the technologies that were used and the upper detection limits. No, it, was I think so. it was higher than 50,000. <laughs> Yeah, so so there were readings um, that went above fifty thousand. Uh, the highest, I believe, was eighty eight thousand um, from one of those wells. Um, the caveat with that, at least for carb, is that when we calibrate the instrumentation, it's calibrated uh, up to fifty thousand parts per million. So readings past that um, aren't, since they're not calibrated, aren't necessarily reliable, right? As, as something that we've calibrated the instruments to. Um, but um, we can get those readings past the 50,000 ppm. Um, as far as, as sample collection, um, the during the inspection when we're using the equipment, it's just it's taking real time readings, so it doesn't actually uh, collect any sample to to take and have analyzed um, post inspection. But I'm really grateful, Cesar, for that flag um, and and raising the desire to understand like holistically, you know, as you, as you, as we've mentioned, and as you're, um, you're speaking to that, you know, we're going out there to, and methane is frankly a proxy for us to detect if there's leaks. That doesn't tell us what other potential toxic compounds might be in those emissions. And it could vary from field to field. Um, we did not include that as part of um, our proposal to you all in the joint inspection plan. But um, now that you've raised it, um, it's something that we can go back and, and sort of talk with our colleagues within the methane task force around how we might include that in future joint inspection efforts. So I want to acknowledge and uh, you know, just, just acknowledge that, yeah, we, we tested for methane and, and there is uncertainty around what toxic compounds might be associated with that. And then of course, too, in addition to that, to complicate things, um, as Heather mentioned, uh, there's also a lot of uncertainty in um, being able to understand uh, there's, you know, if there's toxic compounds in a leak, there's a lot of factors that can influence the degree to which someone actually might be exposed, right? So Heather mentioned, you know, the weather, right? If, if those toxic compounds dissipate, um, 
whether someone is more sensitive or not. Um, so there's just, there's a lot, there is a lot of uncertainty in this. And I just wanted to acknowledge that um, and also um, appreciate your, your flag CISAR around wanting to learn more about that. So we can definitely take that back to the, to the task force and, and consider it as we um, move forward on future joint inspection efforts. Yeah, thank you. I, I would love for that community outreach and that sampling to be a core part of this. Um, just cause now the way the model is set up community health and health effects seem like a second or third priority. And I think including those things um, and especially getting um, like health effects information from residents that are near those leaks to see if, if they have any effects or symptoms linked with chronic exposure would be an important way of, of noting how bad these leaks have been over time. Appreciate that. Perhaps at this juncture, it might be helpful to transition to Matt, who um, is going to talk about some of these next steps that we've identified um, and, and obviously want to discuss with you all. Great. Well, I want to talk a little bit about the reinspections um, and how uh, the next steps are CalGym and, and CARB do uh, for these types of inspections. So CalGym typically will reinspect the wells after they've been fixed uh, five days after, and then a second reinspection 10, 10 days after the repairs to try to confirm that the repair held. Uh, the Air District also inspects the wells to ensure that the repairs were successful and will take additional enforcement action if the leaks were not repaired as required. Um, for this effort, you know, Air District and CalGym are coordinating our follow-up inspections. And like we mentioned today, uh, we had inspectors out in the field uh, confirming and looking at the repairs that were done last week. Uh, since the Air District has the ability uh, and authority to enforce CARB's oil and gas methane regulation, uh, the Air District will also conduct any additional follow-up of that uh, regulation too. Now then another step for us is you know providing you updates as we move along here. As we committed to, we plan to provide updates on the repairs on these wells to the community. And in addition to providing our initial findings here, um, we will and then as progress is made on repairing these leaks and confirming that those repairs have been uh, sufficient to repair them. Um, we'll provide updates um, by the means that was requested by the community. And so we've already mentioned that we anticipate having an email out to the CSC members by Monday, June 5th, summarizing information that we've talked about today and then any other the latest developments that we um, happens over the next few days. I um, also mentioned uh, earlier too about uh, we plan to attend the Ivan meeting next week and representative from the three agencies will also be able to provide an overview of results of the inspections and repairs at that meeting too. And then uh, you know as this subcommittee meets and continues to meet we're happy to provide a space to discuss where we are as well and to hopefully with those avenues, we can keep you informed of how our agencies are handling these particular inspections. Of course, I would like to note that additional enforcement actions will be forthcoming uh, from the Air District, which will include violations and fines. Um, the Air District is currently evaluating, evaluating what this enforcement action entails. Um, and then kind of stepping back a little bit and a bigger picture on, on how we handle inspections and leaks. When CalGym identifies uh, that wells have leaked, we'll put them on an annual inspection cycle in addition to those wells that are already in critical and environmentally sensitive areas that CalGym inspects on an annual basis. The Air District has an increased inspection cycle with these wells and inspects them every six months. And CARB will uh, coordinate with the Air District on inspection of additional wells in this area to ensure compliance throughout the year. 
Uh, joint agency inspections will continue based on community input and our resource availability. Um, while resources availability may preclude all three agencies from conducting joint inspections like this first initial effort, um, we will continue to co coordinate enforcement actions and uh, based on inspection results and monitoring efforts from our these participating agencies. I think I'd also like to know, as we kind of discussed earlier with Rohit, that you know, we are looking forward to doing the training exercise and helping the community identify potential hazards. And that's a, a certainly uh, a, a good way, hopefully we can interact with the community. Um, finally, I would just wanna say, if you have additional complaint concerns, um, while this inspection effort that we just outlined is identified to help address uh, the methane leaks that are from active idle and orphan wells. Um, it may not be able to address leaks that arise in the future. And even with additional inspections and plan for these wells, a leak could arise at any time. This is why CalGEM looks forward to hosting the training as we just mentioned, um, and how the community can help identify the hazards of concern. Um, additionally, similarly, like we said at, uh, at our last meeting, um, we like to encourage the members of the public who do have immediate concerns about gas leaks in their community to dial 911. This includes, for instance, if you hear gas leaking out of a well or the attendant facility, if you see gas bubbling up from a cellar with, of a well, or if you feel something like an seismic event, an earthquake that could have disrupted the oil and gas infrastructure, encourage you to call 911. We also encourage people that may smell gas, not only to dial 911, but also contact their local uh, gas utility. Since natural gas is colorless and odorless, um, what captain is a foul smelling chemical that's added to the gas um, and to be sent to, and used within the home to make it easier to detect. If the community members smell gas, uh, they should call their gas utility immediately as that might indicate that there's a leak within the home or within the natural gas distribution system. Uh, if community members see black oil coming out of the ground, they should report the spill to the Office of Spill Prevention and Response. And the phone number for that is 800-852-7550. Now we realize that you may have additional concerns about the impact of oil and gas production in your local, um, in the local air quality and the public health. Um, and as such, you can you know, talk to our local air district as you guys already are, and also the public health department with those type of questions. And as you develop further uh, questions or you may have a complaint about an operator or about oil and gas uh, facilities in your community, um, there's actually a variety of ways to file complaints. And um, rather than trying to uh, give websites now, I'm gonna actually drop that into the chat of the different ways to contact either CalGEM, uh, the Air District or CARB. And so we can follow up with those uh, complaints and investigate them further. I think that's it for now for next steps. And uh, if you have additional complaints, um, I think uh, ask to open it up again for further questions. Great, thanks, Matt. So I'll just I'll just reflect. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we had completed everything on Thursday, um, and so we've we've had a couple of days to make progress on this. Um, I'm actually. I'm really glad to hear that with the exception of the wells that are uh, deserted by their operator, which we are bringing a contractor in to fix, it sounds like all of the other leaks have been reported to be repaired by operators. And I know the team went out today to confirm that. We haven't had a chance as we're meeting with you all to hear the results of that. So we will provide you um, the results of that, um, as well as any updates we might have from our contractor on timing to fix the 11 wells that are associated with the, the deserted operator. Um, so 
as as things unfold and we learn more, we we plan to provide you guys with written updates. The first one coming on Monday. Um, so really want to keep the lines of communication open. And of course, you know we have this subcommittee venue, which we're really looking forward to um, to continuing to meet with you all to have these conversations. Um, if you guys think of questions, of course, you know between now and then. Please don't hesitate to let us know so we might be able to prepare to be responsive to that the next time we meet. Um, I did flag though that there um, is, uh, uh, I think Jesus, I'm uh, sorry, I'm reading Spanish here, but it looks like you're, we want to know how close the wells are that were leaking to the school. Um, I, uh, I don't actually know the exact distance right now. Does anyone on this call for the wells that were leaking that were near the school, the exact distance? I, I want to say- Yeah, go ahead. I want to say the distance was around 400 to 500 feet away from the school for those uh, wells that was closest to the school. Um, we can absolutely, however, um, uh, Jesus, we can absolutely um, confirm that. And if it's all right with you, we'll reflect that in the written update that we plan to send out to y'all on Monday. Can I ask, there's a lot of, um, a lot of comments in Spanish in the chat. I'm trying to read through them. Uh, I don't want to miss anything. Courtney, there... most of those are, I, from my understanding, are the translated version of the English comments and questions. And we've been tracking, and it's, I think we are caught up. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. I think we are caught up with all the questions for you from the chat. We're just catching up now on translating them. Thank you. Okay, that's helpful. <laughs> Um, Emma. Yes, thank you, Courtney. Um, so if I'm understanding uh, the follow up based on the findings is uh, plugging up those abandoned wells. And um, you, you mentioned that the ones that do have operators were um, they were also repaired, I guess, at this point. Um, but I, I am wondering then, are these findings going to lead to any other type of policy change to be proactive in the future? Um, I, I'm I'm feeling like it's first of all this is very infuriating information to be quite honest with you because residents live right next to it next to these sites and folks are living with this issue no matter how small or, or great the concentration levels are it's still an impact the residents are having to face and so I'm hoping I was well I was hoping to hear more about how this information will lead to greater policy change to make sure that these issues are not happening as frequently, perhaps. Um, is, is there a future policy change in the horizon based on this information? Um, well, I can share with you that at least internally, um, you know, this has been helpful for us to like work more in more coordinated fashion with our colleagues um, across uh, the Air District and, this, and other agencies. Through this, we've actually, it's been a really excellent learning opportunity for us in terms of where there are areas that we need to work more together on um, clarifying. So um, that is actually, I, they are policy decisions around, you know, when, when do we want to be really clear that we are going to um, notify first responders and Cal OES. So this is work that we've identified internally through this effort that we, we have to undertake. Um, so I would say that I, I expect there to be um, some additional uh, policy determinations and guidance internally around how we work together and how we bring in first responders and emergency, uh, the Office of Emer Emergency Services in response to what we find within our inspection programs. I think this is going to really strengthen the impact of our, of our inspection programs frankly, across the jurisdictions. Um, but I, of course, also invite any of my colleagues on the methane task force to, to add and chime in. If there's anything more you'd like to add. Sure, I can speak a little bit from the district side. Um, currently, our leak detection and repair rules for oil and gas are being amended. Um, they're in the public process currently. 
And some of those new requirements, we have dropped the leak threshold across several rules. We have tightened repair timelines and increased inspection frequencies for operators. And so we feel like all of those things um, will lead to change um, within the industry. And I think I would just add from CARB's perspective, yes to all of that. And also I think we're really interested in hearing and continuing conversations with you all as well um, to see, you know, sort of where, you know, we could potentially make improvements to our process as well. Thank you all. Emma, hopefully, at least I know maybe that doesn't address your complete concern, but hopefully starts to answer how each agency will start to address it. Thank you it. all very much for all of that. If oh, maybe there was a delay. I think she was saying thank you. Thanks, Emma. And um, and I'm just noting kind of, of course, as we're taking notes today, I'm noting that, you know, it sounds like maybe just regulatory um kind of processes and regulations is of note. And we're all, always, now that this is a subcommittee meeting, you know, we have a variety of topics we can help cover and maybe some of these processes and, and procedures can be some of our upcoming topics as well. We are just over uh, the time that we set aside for just any other open discussion. So maybe I'll just ask before we transition to that, if there's anyone else from CalGEM or from CARB or from the Air District that wanted to share kind of any closing remarks to, to this piece of the agenda. Sure, I'll just, um, I'll hop in and I, 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 wanna, I wanna thank everyone here. Um, you know, when we came to you all at the end of April, um, you gave us some really excellent feedback on our, on our effort. Um, this, as I mentioned, has been a really, uh, frankly, a really awesome learning opportunity for all three agencies to be able to um, come into your community and learn together on, on how we can strengthen each of our relative inspection efforts. Um, you've given us your time and space to hear what we found and to work with us on, on some of the work that remains. Um, so just really wanted to thank you all. And, um, um, you know, I think I can say on behalf of the Methane Task Force, you know, we're committed to addressing the concerns that you guys have, and we look forward to having um, continued conversation in this venue on, on um, many of the efforts that we talked about. Do we have, do, I'm sorry, Jessica, real quick, just uh, in terms of timing and agenda, um, do we have time to do the map demo or are we feeling like we might need to punt that for next time? I would offer, since it was a big ask of folks, I know we only have a short period of time, but maybe just to briefly do it, that was going to be my next suggestion. And yeah, I know that was a, an ask um, from the committee from the April 26th meeting. So I'll go ahead and pass it to you, Courtney. And we'll just at the end, what I'm doing is just for folks to know, if you do have to hop off it and we go a little over 5.30, we're noting the action items in the chat, but we will follow up with that big email on Monday also with sort of like the action items that came out of today's meeting in case you missed them. Thanks, Courtney. That sounds great. Um, great. Um, I'm going to kick it over to my colleague Josh here in a moment. Um, he's going to provide a very quick high level intro demo. Um, so just uh, in case some of you weren't able to attend the, the CSC meeting, uh, we presented on um, an expanded effort that we're undertaking to go out and abandon properly cap um, wells that have been deserted and orphaned by operators. Um, there is new money to do this, uh, but the problem is bigger than the amount of money that we have. So we really had to think about how we prioritize which wells we're gonna focus on. Um, part of that has been creating a mapping tool so we know where, they're, where, we, where we think they're located in the state. Um, Y'all asked for us to show you how to use that mapping tool. Um, so that way you can see what wells we've identified as likely orphan in, in your area. So with that, I'm gonna kick it to Josh who's gonna um, introduce you to this um, tool. It is on our website. Uh, we'll drop the link in the chat here shortly for you to access it. Um, and with that, Josh, take it away. Afternoon, everyone. Josh Atkins with the Monitoring Compliance Unit. Let me just share my screen.
Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay. So you can just go to Google real quick if you want and type in CalGym, click it. This will come up. I've already opened it over here where we can just do this. And you basically scroll down to where it says state oil, gas, well, plug, and abandonments. Click on that. And then well screening methodology. From there, you'll see a document going over how we prioritized everything as well as the GIS map location. I'm just going to go ahead and open it because I've already done it here for time constraints. Um, these are your layers. Okay, so that's this over here, which shows you a tier one being the top of the tier. So that's most critical versus less critical. Just we had to prioritize them in some sort of fashion. So you can see the color dots here. Those are all different deserted or orphan wells. If you know a particular field of interest, you can click it on there in your field boundaries. There's a little bit of a delay, it'll kick on here. And you can click within that field boundary and see that's the Edison field. There's other options here that you can click on as well as I have the cities turned on. You can see this is Arvin here. I would recommend if you're gonna go through this map, go over here and click County and then click Kern County. Because if you only click on a city, you'll only get these two wells, which are in Arvin's actual city limits, not necessarily the ones that are on the outskirts or outside the incorporated area. And then you can see Lamont here. Um, real quickly, you could open this ribbon down here. And if you know there's a particular operator that gives you heartburn or a field or a city that you're looking for, you can find it in those areas. One thing to note, when you see these stack like this, if you click on this, let's see, if I click on one that's just kind of like all on top of each other, I may actually get more than one well. So I would recommend zooming in and then you're able to see the spacing better to figure out exactly where it is. The other thing, if you click right here on your base map, you can turn on whatever imagery you'd like, if there's a, something you you know exactly where this is now and it makes more sense to you, whereas you have Highway 58 here, 99 here, but for Arvin in particular, you go down and you'll be able to see the park areas or the school areas that were the concern and figure out where it is. And the way you could do that real easily is just clicking this measurement tool and then you can just measure the distance accordingly. And then from there, you just click out of it and you get back to it. Um, because Lamont is not necessarily in the incorporated cities list, I would recommend doing the county first. And then, because then you can kind of see a larger area. The only downside to that is your tier system down here is going to be incorporated with that entire area. But as you zoom in on it, you'll see them light up. From this lower list here, one important thing is that in your options, you can export to CSV. So if there's something you want to look at in more detail, you can export it to your computer. Um, there's other filters that you have in here that you can use, as well as filters in here, where you just go to this filter system and then you can add an expression. The number one thing here I would say, if you know what you're looking for or you're interested in anything, is always use is any of, and this will allow you to select multiple of something as, as opposed to one at a time. It's kind of a super quick overview, but you can go on here and play with it and see whatever you like. And there's already some bookmark cities. And then this is a sharing tool. If you have something pulled up and you want to send it to someone. Thank you so much, Josh. I know this was very quick. Um, and we're happy if folks want to have very specific questions or want to go deeper on um, this as Josh started to peel back. There's a lot you could do with this, um, but at least to start, if you just want to see the wells and learn of, learn about the wells um, that we uh, at CalGem uh, believe might be orphaned, um, you know, hitting Kern County and zooming in and clicking on the wells, it'll pop up the information that will be a really great starting point for you. Um, and if you have, if you start doing that, you've got questions, let us know. 
we'll set up some one-on-one -on -one time with Josh, our guru here, um, so you guys can really go deep on. But one thing I just wanted to make sure everyone is, uh, just to remind everyone is that this, um, this map is not all of the wells in your community, right? This map shows the wells that we think um, very well might have been deserted and orphaned by an operator because we have evidence of that, like they're not complying with certain things. Um, for us to finally make it that like a, a, an actual determination, yep, there is no operator around, we go through a lengthy process. Um, and also just, just as a reminder, the color scheme here and the prioritization scheme, we've talked about in length um, and there's information on our website, but it's very much a risk-based prioritization. So you'll see that wells that are near communities, wells where we have a history of leaks, they are um, at the top. Um, so just wanted to remind folks of that. Oh, and Josh has it up here showing the overview of the methodology. And I know we went through that last time, just a reminder. Are there any questions from anyone on um, the mapping tool that we that we've developed? And I did drop in the chat. I know Josh showed how you can get to this from Google, but I also dropped in the chat a direct link so that way you can get there. Sorry. Yeah, this, this tool is amazing. And I think it's, it's in a way like a very, very good way to visualize it. Um, I'm glad that it's not all of the wells. Um, because I think, you know, based on the ones that have been inspected, and the ones that were found leaking, it's like 40% leak rate. So that means four out of every 10 may be leaking. Hopefully, that's not the trend. Uh, fingers crossed. Um, but I, I would, the only question I have is if you could explain, explain the tiers, um, that way I can yes. better understand the information. Oh, I'm really glad you asked. Um, so, uh, you know, we have a list of thousands and thousands of wells statewide we think might be orphaned and we have limited money. So we had to figure out a way to, to start sort of like a first, first order evaluation of like, which one should we look at first for potentially permanently capping, you know, and we, through a public process, landed on um, a, a method to prioritize wells based on the risk that they present, right? Risk to communities, risk to waterways. So we identified lots of uh, fact-based metrics that tell us something about the potential risk for a well. And we scored each well for each of those criteria that created a well risk score. Um, and then what we did is we looked at all of the wells and their score and those numbers like tier one, tier two, we basically normalized it. So it's like a relative. So if it's ranked one, that means based on our method, those wells um, had um, the highest, they scored the highest on factors that are indicators of risk, right? So like I was saying, a lot of the ones that are the highest scoring, they're highest scoring because of where they're located, meaning they're near people, they're in a disadvantaged community, so they're near vulnerable people. Um, and there's also a lot of factors in here that say something about the well itself, right? A big one is, has it leaked before? If it's leaked before, there is a higher likelihood that it will leak again. So that was a, another risk factor we considered. So hopefully that wasn't too much, Cesar, too much in the weeds, but um, basically those tiers indicate um, how much risk we think they, they might bring. And it helps us look first at those wells that we think are the highest risk. Um, and those are the ones that we wanna start to tackle with our state abandonment, um, with the money that we have to permanently cap wells. And also just on that, a quick plug and reminder, um, we did just send out and maybe it just happened a few hours ago um, and maybe we can, um, Jessica, send it out to this group as well. Um, the I know we talked about it last time we met, but we actually have the listserv notice, the notice for our June 27th methane task force meeting. We're gonna provide an update on our state abandonment program. So we really hope that you guys can join. I think it'll be a really good meeting. 
Um, and we'll make sure that you have that information on how you can join. Um, maybe we can put that up in the update that we send out on Monday. Yes. And I heard the pun there, Courtney, it was your quick plug. Talk about plug and abandonment. I think that's a great way um, to end such a great meeting. Um, I wanna be cognizant of the time um, and thank you all. And thank you so much for uh, your team, Courtney, for walking through so many different things uh, to CARB for uh, you know helping us walk through and answer so many detailed questions about the inspections. Um, and of course, to you all, to Courtney's point, I just, I don't wanna um, repeat what she said, but just echo all the things to you all um, because we wouldn't have the presentation we had today and all of the feedback for you all and for the community members you all serve if it wasn't for your participation today and for your great interaction and questions. Um, I will briefly, for the sake of the fact that I don't think all of them are translated so that maybe they'll get interpreted when I read them out loud, I'll briefly read out the action items. Um, but I understand if you have to go. This meeting was recorded. We will post it in English and in Spanish on our site, including the portion where Josh just went over, Joshua just went over the um, the GIS or the, the mapping tool. So if you kind of need to remember, or maybe um, you thought some of the tools that he showed were important to remember, we do have that recorded. So really briefly, CalGEM action item number one, um, we'll send date and time options to the district and we will forward those on to you for your feedback for a community training opportunity. And that will be an in-person and Zoom, so a hybrid meeting. The action item number two, you keep hearing about it and I think the email is going to be lengthy and informational is we will send an email to you all um, on Monday with everything that was presented today and some of the next steps and action items that you heard, as well as contact information and maybe a link to um, a couple of upcoming meetings, opportunities, interactive map, just sort of a summary of everything that happened. Action item number three um, was just based on one of the comments from uh, one of the community members is just to consider including some component of community outreach and understanding of health impacts the next time we talk about or even go out and inspect wells, including what other compounds might be leaking with them. Action item number four is uh, the district will work with agencies just to let you all know we will be, this is a sub standing subcommittee as, as it stands now. So we will have a follow-up subcommittee. Um, and I think we already have some topics identified, um, but certainly we'll work with you all to schedule that and to have an agenda for that meeting. Um, that relates to action item number five, we will save space during a future subcommittee meeting to continue that discussion we had briefly from Emma De La Rosa's comments about upcoming policy changes. Um, and then finally, we will have the methane task force meeting notice sent out to you all. I think that summarizes not, of course, everything we talked about, but certainly the big action items and next steps that we all had. Um, we're a little over time, but I don't know if anyone had any kind of final questions or comments before we close it out. Awesome. Well, Courtney, thank you and your team so much. Heather, you and your team so much. Um, and all of you, thank you so much. I know this is these are these are long and, and technical and tough discussions, but it just yields such good results for the community and really the region. So thank you all. Have a great night and we look forward to following up with you soon. Thank you. Bye everyone.